The speech from the throne made vague references to the government's promises on guns, but what do those promises really mean? Tony Bernardo is with the Canadian Shooting Sports Association, joins me now from his office uh, on this issue. And Tony, I'm confused. The government's promising to get handguns and assault weapons off of our streets. We know that when it comes to uh, gang crime, to homicides, handguns are a real problem, but I haven't heard an awful lot about so-called assault weapons. That's a vague term. It's open to a lot of interpretation. What are they talking about here? Are they talking about every semi-automatic weapon? Are they concerned about every semi-automatic firearm out there? Or are they? is there a gain problem that I simply don't know about? Well, we're not really sure, Brian. Uh, the problem you have is that there is no definition for what an assault assault weapon is. An assault rifle, there's an actual definition, but an assault weapon seems to be an invention of the uh, Violence Policy Center down in Washington, uh, and they're a strongly anti-gun group. It was designed to encompass as many civilian firearms as it possibly could. So basically, an assault weapon is anything they say it is. Uh, there doesn't seem to be an awful lot of gang problems mm -hmm. with assault rifles, so we can only make uh, the assumption that it's anything that the liberals say they don't like. So I, I know that when there was the so-called assault weapons ban in the United States, th there were definitions of, yes, of what that encompassed, but it was mostly cosmetic. You know, th does yeah. it have a folding stock? Does it have a, um, a trigger handle? Things like that. Things That's that right. don't actually affect how powerful the firearm is, uh, how accurate it is, how far it can shoot. None of those. A no. and, and that's part of what I guess has a lot of target shooters, hunters, worried that the firearms that they rely on for their sport, for their practice, could all of a sudden be targeted by a government that is, mm, let's be honest, not known to be friendly to those in the shooting sports. Yeah, and it's absolutely a valid concern when when one of the criteria of, of whether or not a gun looks ooey is whether or not it's got a black plastic stock. It, well, yeah, realize, I forgot about that. You know, yeah, is it when black? you realize that over the course of years now, all the good walnuts gone. So the price of, of walnut stocks has gone through the roof and many of the firearms or, uh, companies out there are manufacturing the stocks out of plastic as a cost saving measure to try to keep the cost of firearms to a reasonable level. So there's all kinds of firearms out there now with black plastic stocks, especially when when you consider the uh, valid um, weather resistance that that type of stock has. Mm. They're very much in demand with hunters. So hunters have a legitimate worry here. One of the uh, issues that you've raised, uh, and I know you were commenting on uh, in the media about this on the weekend, is they also have a promise to change the Firearms Advisory Committee. Mm -hmm. They're going to be, instead of just talking to law enforcement and those in the shooting sports, they're going to add women's groups. They're going to add public health. It seems yeah. like a very politicized version of a Firearms Advisory Committee. Yeah, you would think that uh, the people who would be on a committee like that would be people who are experts in firearms, how they operate, how they are regulated, what impact they have on people. However, the the mandate of this government seems to be uh, to put people on there who have feelings about firearms. Uh, we wouldn't want to offend anybody's feelings on this. So what we're going to do is we're going to make it so that these people are, are represented on there. Uh, quite frankly, they can't even use the thin excuse that women represent, you know, the majority of people who who are uh, assaulted with firearms because that's not true. It's about two thirds male. So, you know, there's nobody being put on there from men's groups. I, I don't know if you've noticed that. Uh, <laughs> I may have. Yeah. Yeah, you might have. Yeah, but I mean, the the bottom line is right now the firearms advisory committee is composed of people who have expertise in firearms and their application. So let me put it to you pretty bluntly. You Do you currently sit or previously sat on the firearms? No, I've team? sat on the committee since its inception. Okay. Uh, Wendy Kukier is who comes to mind when I, think, when I hear them say they're going to be putting public health advocates and, and women's groups advocates on there. Wendy Kukier is famous for not wanting to debate anyone on the firearms issue. I remember after the uh, Quebec 
long gun registry decision. She was in the, the foyer of the House of Commons. She came out, she made her statement. The media were just essentially taking notes and, and asking her softball questions. I put to her that Quebec and Vermont, two jurisdictions with very different firearms regulations, have very similar homicide rates, or did at that point. Uh, and, you know, so obviously it's not an issue of gun control. Vermont, freest state in the Union and in, in the United States. Right. Quebec, at that point, trying to keep the long gun registry. So it's not an issue of gun control that, that keeps people safe. And, and she didn't want to talk about that. She refused to engage on that point. She could be sitting across from you on this firearms advisory committee helping to make public policy in the future. Yeah, and she has before. Um, when when uh, Ms. Sukier was on the advisory committee at the same time I was, which was back uh, in the days of Anne McClellan, um, we had put forward a, a motion to try to institute safety programs for children in schools in regards to firearms. This was a don't touch it, get an adult safety program. Okay. And It, uh, it wasn't a giving handguns to kids in grade three program. <laughs> no, no, not not at all. It was a safety program designed to keep our children safe. Yeah. And uh, we we put this forward on the basis that we teach our children sex education. We teach them how to cross a road. We teach them many, many things in their lives to keep them safe. And with the uh, many, many millions, I mean, we have no idea how many millions of firearms there are in Canada, but we've got import records for 21 million of them. Um, we know that at some point in time, virtually every child will have some kind of encounter with a firearm. And, and we want to make sure that when they do that, it's a safe one. So stop, don't touch it, get an adult. That's a pretty great message to be giving to our little ones, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And uh, she opposed this. She opposed it fiercely in that committee because she didn't want children to have safety education involving firearms. She didn't even want it in the school wow. curriculum. Okay, so this is what we could be facing yeah. going forward. Uh, firearms yeah. owners in Quebec in particular, yeah. yeah, they're going to be facing a provincial gun registry. They're saying it's going to be free. It'll cost the taxpayers in general $5 million, but no cost to... Uh, individual gun owners. It's up to this 17 sounding, million now. <laughs> it's up to 17 million now. It's up now. to 17 I thought million it was, already. They haven't even five, got rid of the gate. It was 5 million when they announced it late last week. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, man. This is sounding all too familiar, Tony. Well, it, it, it's it's unbelievable. I can't imagine why Quebec is going back into this rabbit hole again. You know, they, they've been down this road. It was a complete and total disaster every place it's been tried. Quebec just recently made cuts to their health care system. The bridges are falling into the St. Lawrence. There are potholes big enough to swallow you whole in the yeah. streets. Oh, yeah. And they're going to be putting this kind of stupid, airy-fairy measure forward. And, and the penalty for noncompliance is a fine. Which is as it should be. You know, yeah, if you're absolutely. going to have it, I, I, I'm in agreement with that. I don't right. want them to have it. Right. Look, part of the problem in Quebec is that uh, despite a large number of firearms owners, none of the parties will take this issue on. There's been no Gary Breitkreitz come forward in any of the parties to say, hold on a minute, this isn't being fair yeah. to the parties, uh, to the people. There, Quebec is one of the biggest hunting markets in Canada. Firearms ownership is very strong in the province, but they yeah. don't have political representation. Yeah, over 25% of the nation's firearms owners are in Quebec. There's piles of them. Yeah. But you're right, they have nobody championing their cause in Quebec. It's a terrible situation. In, in the vote for this uh, Bill 64, it was unanimous yeah. to go forward with it, with all political parties. It's the only province that I see unanimous um, votes on a regular basis. On anything that's on the far left, they will have a unanimous vote. So in Quebec, essentially, your politics are, do you want far left separatist or far left federalist? And yes, that's so. your choice. It, it's unfortunate. Yeah, uh, and, it, and it's shameful that Quebec politicians care so little about the people they represent that they're not even willing to consider the opinion of hundreds of thousands of Quebecers. Well, perhaps it's time for them to flex their muscle and make sure that in the next election, whenever that does come about, that uh, their voices are heard. Uh, you continue to be a voice for, for Reason, Tony. How concerned are you about the overall um, political tone 
be it federal or provincial across Canada when it comes to firearms right now, how concerned should individual gun owners be? Very concerned. This is not getting better. Um, the, uh, the Liberals have vowed to implement the United Nations firearms marking system, mm -hmm. which is catastrophic to the Canadian industry. They vowed to go ahead and sign the United Nations Arms Trade Treaty, which virtually advocates Canada's sovereignty in its ability to make domestic law over to a three-quarter majority of countries attending a conference once every six years. Absolutely irresponsible, heinous government. We're also going to be blamed for when the terrorist incidences start happening. As well, we, the, we saw that in, in San Bernardino. And exactly. as I pointed out last week, California has, in, in some measures, stricter gun control laws in Canada. You, yes. you, the background checks are everything that the gun grabbers want. They've got a 10-day waiting period, which we don't have that here. Once you've got your license, you don't have to wait 10 days to buy a firearm in this country. No. No. So they've got everything, and yet, and yet, San Bernardino still happened with legally purchased firearms. Yeah, of course. And, and the, they had not even caught the bad guys yet. And the calls were going out from the White House on down. We need more gun control. We need more gun control. And did you notice how fast the left-wing media shut up when they found out it was a terrorist incident? Yeah. Well, it's uh, it's sad, but the same thing will happen here. Tony, Absolutely. thanks for uh, thanks for joining me today, and uh, continue the good fight with uh, the CSSA. Thank you very much, Brian. It's great to have you guys on side. Uh, the Rebel is an awesome tool. Thank you.